I had a great time yesterday speaking at CPAC in Washington, D.C. I flew in for the day. I gave my speech. I flew back. Simple as. But before I could even board the plane to fly back, I noticed that Joe Biden's presidential campaign had attacked me over my speech. I was very confused. This year's speech was relatively quite tame compared to last year's. No calls for eradication. Not too much focus on the issue. What could they possibly be upset about? And then I read the attack. They wrote, quote, top Trump advocate at CPAC echoes, there was a typo, they didn't spell echoes correctly, but I, you know, it's the Biden campaign, so. Top Trump advocate at CPAC echoes MAGA's Project 2025 plan to go after marriage equality during a second Trump term. And then it put a a colon and they wrote out what I said, sort of. They uh, also misspelled this and had all sorts of errors, but basically they got the gist. They said, this is what this awful Michael says. And I said, marriage is between a man and a woman. So put their tweet aside for a second. Here is actually what I said in video, in audio at CPAC. They really believe that they are masters of the universe. They think they're gods who can create the world anew through the power of their words. But they aren't, and they can't. They can't really turn men into women. They can't really turn a couple of men, or a couple of women, or three men and a billy goat, for that matter, into a marriage. That's just not what marriage is. No disrespect is intended to anyone. Some people don't want to get married. Okay, there's no obligation. But marriage has a meaning. Marriage is and always has been the union of a man and a woman ordered toward the procreation and education of children. If you don't like that, don't blame me. (laughs) I didn't set the rules. It wasn't the mean old conservatives who did this. We did not invent marriage. Marriage is a natural institution. It just is what it is. The left will slander us as hateful for observing this fact. There's nothing hateful about it. There's nothing hateful about reality. Quite the opposite, actually. The Biden campaign was very, very upset that I articulated the view of marriage held by every single person everywhere throughout all of history until about five minutes ago. Not surprising. Not surprising at all, actually. I should have anticipated this. The libs get triggered by common sense all the time. The awkward part, though, for the Biden campaign is that I was simply paraphrasing the view that President Joe Biden himself held until very, very recently. The Defense of Marriage Act, where we've all voted, not where I voted and others said, look, marriage is between a man and a woman and states must respect that. Nobody's violated that law. There's been no challenge to that law. Why do we need a constitutional amendment? Marriage is between a man and a woman. What's the game going on here? I did not think that anything could top the crazy reaction to last year's CPAC speech. But this year might take the cake, as the President of the United States is now attacking me for agreeing with him. I'm Michael Knowles. This is The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. The libs are up in arms, not just about me. They're also up in arms about Trump because Trump said that Russia defeated Hitler, which it it did. But the libs are upset about that because they've never cracked a history book in their entire lives. So we will talk about that in a moment. First, though, we're going to talk about Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles. Free should mean exactly that, free. When you switch to Pure Talk today, you will get a free Samsung 5G smartphone. There's no four-line requirement. There's no activation fee. Qualifying plans start at just $35 a month for unlimited talk, text, and 15 gigs of data and mobile hotspot. Pure Talk gives you phenomenal coverage on America's most dependable 5G network. It's the same coverage you know and love, but for half the price of the other guys. 
The average family saves almost $1,000 a year. Let Pure Talk's expert U.S. customer service team help you make the switch today. You go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, to claim eligibility for your free brand new Samsung 5G smartphone and start saving on wireless today. That is puretalk.com slash Knowles. I have my Pure Talk phone. I love my Pure Talk phone. I can have it not only at my home and in America, I can even take it overseas with me now. They've got, Their service is just phenomenal. They have got the best network in the country and they share your beliefs and you save a lot of money. puretalk.com slash Knowles. Always great to be at CPAC. I have to tell you, I was taken aback by the controversy. I, I know that the libs believe that because five seconds ago they said that marriage is no longer what it always has been everywhere in the world. I know that they really believe that they did something, but still, I, I don't know. I, to me, that didn't seem like the craziest, most outrageous part of my speech. In my speech at CPAC, I said that historically speaking, we're not a nation of immigrants. I said that historically speaking, the notion that diversity is our strength is rather novel and silly and ridiculous. I don't know. There were a few lines in there that I felt, okay, the libs are really going to push back on this. But no, these guys, the only thing they cared about is I said that the view that uh, Christians and Muslims and uh, conservative Jews and uh, pagans from antiquity through the present, and but pretty much that everybody has ever held about marriage continues to be true. And it isn't, it isn't different now just because some robed lawyers on the Supreme Court said so a few years ago. I, I, even I am surprised that the articulating the view of marriage that was held by virtually every single current prominent Democrat politician until at the earliest 2012, 2011, 2012, maybe, and then inclu- as late as 2015, that, that, that I hold that view. And then the Libs say, they're trying to take us back to the 1950s. I, I don't know. On this question, I'm trying to take you back to 2014. <laughs> I'm trying to take you back to Joe Biden's view, the current president's view, not that long ago. But they really came after me. The Biden campaign, uh, Governor Patrick Bateman over there in California, Newsom came after me personally and tweeted out the speech. Really, really silly stuff. Now, I had to fly in and fly out, and which is fine. I'm glad to be back in the studio today. There is, however one great regret that I have. And that is, I was scheduled to meet the leader of El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, possibly my favorite, one of my favorite world leaders today. This is the man who took El Salvador from being the most dangerous nation in the world to being the safest nation in the Western Hemisphere. Really strong conservative leader. He gave an amazing speech, uh, giving thanks to God after his recent election. This guy, I was... I don't know, within 20 or 30 minutes of being scheduled to get to shake this guy's hand and have a few words and just say, you are the man, Mr. Bukele. But my flight, my flight was my flight. It was the last one out of D.C. to get back to Nashville. And we're talking about matters of the heart now. Never doubt that I love you all, that I would give up on shaking the hand of this great world leader just to be back in the studio for all of you this morning. I hope, though, that I have the opportunity to meet Mr. Bukele at some point in the future, either when he's in the States or if I, I don't know, if I go on a vacation to El Salvador or something like that, because this guy brought the house down. I say this with no false modesty and true humility. There was some, there was some buzz around my speech because it got so much play last year. By far, there's not, not even close the most anticipated, most exciting speaker at CPAC yesterday was the leader of El Salvador, everyone, myself included. I, I got to see a little bit of the speech before I had to, had to head out. The guy was electric. He was totally on fire. Here's what he had to say. They say globalism comes to die at CPAC. I'm here to tell you that in El Salvador, they, it's already dead. But if you want globalism to die here too, you must be willing to unapologetically fight against everything and everyone that stands for it. These dark forces are already taking over your country. You may not see it yet, but it's already happening. You don't see it as clearly because people are designed to see linear changes, not exponential ones. We don't always recognize how fast a problem can multiply and spiral out of control. 
The problem is much like the metaphor of the boiling frog. Once the water boils, it's already too late. People fail to see these things. It's our nature. Just like the frog, people become complacent and they don't realize how bad things are getting until it's too late. This is a great insight. Now, if you want to hear more great insights like this and then some insights on those insights, you got to subscribe to the Michael Knowles YouTube channel. Smash that bell right now. Subscribe, ring it, click it, ding it, whatever you got to do. Make sure that you subscribe. Thank you very much. Naib Bukele not only says, look at what we've done in El Salvador. His whole speech was really terrific. He not only gives a warning to the United States, but he has this key insight. He says, people are designed to see things in a linear way. We just expect that the way things are is the way things are always going to be. We're not designed to see exponential changes. He said, what you don't understand is the dark forces at, at work in the world, they're here. They're already working on your country and you're not seeing it. So by the time you catch it, it's going to be a little bit too late. Think about the 2020 election. A lot of Americans realized that the election had been rigged only on election night when we had to wait for all these mail-in ballots to come in or when we had to we had to wait for all these different kinds of strange poll watching uh, shenanigans and the long voter counts because of different provisional kinds of voting well that was all in place 12 to 18 months prior mark zuckerberg to use just one example was donating a lot of money two left-wing organizations explicitly and, and di directly to deny Trump the presidency. Those left-wing organizations were going in, they were setting up drop boxes for ballots that were far away from the county clerks. They were, they were going in, there were ballot harvesting organizations that were going out to the areas where conservatives weren't going to go, and they were collecting those ballots, and they were doing all of this for months and months and months. Conservatives, some knew and were warning about it, but most people just said, oh, no big deal, whatever. We'll see. I think Trump will win the election. Biden's a terrible candidate. He's getting three people to show up to his rallies. Trump, he's had some missteps and some people don't like his tweets, but he's been a good president. We got peace. We got a good economy. Well, we're in the midst of this uh, pandemic. I guess we didn't see that one coming, but I don't know how bad could it really be? And then fast forward to the election, you say, oh, okay, well, they changed the voting rules in all the places that counted, in some cases unconstitutionally, and they dragged this thing out, the counting out for a week or more. And then what do you know, in the middle of the night, they stopped the counting. And when we wake up in the morning, Joe Biden's leading all of a sudden, even though Trump had been leading the whole time. And you think, ah, darn, maybe we should have ballot harvested. Oh, darn, maybe we should have fought some of these ballot drop boxes. Oh, darn, maybe we should have fought the, the widespread mail-ins that were illegal and unconstitutional in some cases. But it was too late. We just... You just don't think that way in America, that, uh, that a major political party is going to rig the election in a way that we've never seen before in the country. That's what Bukele is talking about. And it goes way beyond just the Democrats. You know, I mean, you think about who really rules the country now. Where are most laws made? Most laws are not made in Congress, certainly. Mo most laws are made in the administrative agencies, at the federal level, certainly, and at the state level. And a lot of us just aren't aware of that. A lot of us just... I don't know, we think that our government works like a bill up on Capitol Hill, and but it's, it doesn't. It doesn't work anything like that at all. Bukele is saying, you gotta, you got to watch out for that. And there's a glimmer of hope here. It's not just, oh, the dark, evil libs are out there lurking in the shadows, and we got to... It, I actually think the glimmer of hope is, yeah, and then I cooked them. <laughs> they were trying to cook us in El Salvador, and then I cooked them, because you know what I did? I got elected, and I just rounded up all the criminals who were worshiping Satan and sacrificing people and committing the worst crimes you can possibly imagine, and then I humiliated them on a national level, and then guess, you're going to be shocked what happened. I arrested the criminals, and crime dropped. What I also love about the Bukele example is he shows you it's, this isn't that complicated. These problems are difficult. They, they can be hard to achieve because of political conflict. But, but the, the principles at play here are not that complicated. Bukele gets elected. He says, okay, I want crime to go down. I'll probably arrest the criminals. Simple as. I mean, this is what Ronald Reagan said in his most famous speech of his early career, A Time for Choosing. He said, well, they, the liberals accuse us of offering simple answers to complex problems. Well, 
Maybe the answers are simple. Not easy, but simple. They are simple. And then you have to have the courage to actually do it. You have to have the courage, like Bukele, to stare some face-tattooed demon in the face who's like actually worshiping Satan and who's committing murder and rape and just the worst crimes imaginable. Yeah, look that guy in the face. Then you got to arrest him. Then you got to arrest everyone he knows. Then you got to make videos humiliating him and blast that out to the whole world. And then guess what? You fix your problem. You fix your problem. If, if only we could recognize simple answers and then have courage to implement answers. In our, obviously, America is a little different from El Salvador, but we do the American version of it. Not such a bad idea. Now, you heard the libs when they were attacking me talking about the 2025 plan. What's the 2025 agenda that they're all so worried about? Well, Project 2025 is uh, the brainchild of Kevin Roberts, who is an excellent leader of the Heritage Foundation, probably the most prestigious and important conservative think tank. And it involves many, many people from all around the conservative movement. And Project 2025 is designed to make sure that, assuming a Republican administration comes into office in 2025, assuming, we got to be ready, if a Republican manages to get elected in 2024, they will not have to worry about what to do, what policies to pursue, and who to hire. That will be ready to go on day one. I've been working with all of them on one project since soon after Joe Biden took the oath of office, before any conservative presidential candidates had even entered the race. As my friend and colleague Paul Danz before talked about briefly, our Project 2025 has developed a comprehensive policy agenda, but even more importantly, recruiting people, 20,000 people to go into the next administration, hopefully to help take back this country for you and for your audiences. We want no credit. We want the American people, if President Trump is, is elected again, President Trump and his administration to take credit for that. But it will also be a great sign if all of this is successful, that in fact, as we know in our prayer time, but maybe not every time when we're watching the news, that the Lord is still smiling upon America. Love it. Uh, Kevin is excellent. He is the best leader of the Heritage Foundation that I can imagine for this moment, and one, certainly one of the best leaders ever in the history of that organization. And we need this kind of thing, because this was the big challenge for Trump in 2017, when he took office. It wasn't really Trump's fault. I guess ultimately you'd say it's Trump's fault because Trump was off-putting to some people. And But, you know, again, so much of that was just media spin because they hated that he offered an alternative to the weak and impotent Republican Party that had always just kind of been the uh, the clown, the court jester in the kingdom of liberalism. You know, uh, Trump was not a not a Mitt Romney type. He was not a guy who was going to go in there and at the crucial moments cave and vote with the Dems. So they maligned him as Hitler 2.0. And because they did that, people didn't want to work with Trump. The Trump administration had a major problem getting personnel. The, the, and, and when you don't have personnel, you don't have great policy because personnel is policy. So it is estimated that in order to really turn the ship of the bureaucracy around, because our laws are not really made by Congress anymore. They're made by all these agencies. If you want to really start to turn that ship, we're talking about a, a federal bureaucracy that, depending on how you count it, could be as large as 2 million people. You would, at the very least, have to swap out forty to 50,000 people. Most presidential administrations, if they're lucky, swap out four to 5,000. So you'd have to go 10x. You just need a lot of people. You need, you need people who are not just warm bodies, by the way. You have to have people with a clear political vision who are competent. So you've got to start working on that early. That's part of Project 2025. And then, of course, the policy vision. That's the key. Trump is great. He's got the best political guts that I've seen, gut instincts of any politician in my lifetime, which is how he managed to get elected to the highest office on earth the first time he really gave it a go to run for any office. It's very impressive. Even if you hate Trump, you got to be kind of impressed by that. But, you know, the man can't do everything. And so on certain policy issues, he had one view, then he kind of moderated his view, then someone convinced him of another kind of view. And you know, it's difficult. The man spent his whole career in business, in real estate, in television, in media, and all these things. So he wasn't, you know, some dork sitting down uh, just reading dusty old books all the time wearing tweed and a bow tie. I like those dorks. Those dorks are some of my best friends, but, but he wasn't doing that. And so he needs real top advisors, 
He needs people who have a very clear policy vision who are going to be able to say, okay, Mr. President, building on what you did in your first administration, this is the way we got to go here and here and here on everything, on the economy, on immigration, on family, on war, on on peace, on diplomacy, on just uh, everything, on transportation, for goodness sakes, so that we don't get stuck with uh, Mayor Pete over there again, you know, who's, who's calling the bridges racist and uh, letting trains get into crashes. So, the big takeaway I would say from this is they knock Trump for saying he doesn't learn, he, does, he's not, he can't actually get stuff done, he doesn't score victories. I think he scored some pretty big victories. You know, the fact that the guy managed to get Roe v. Wade overruled, pretty, pretty big in my book. But if that's the knock on him, well, just recognize you've now got representatives of basically the entire conservative movement working on getting that agenda ready on day one. Looks like Trump is quite amenable to working with it. If somehow we manage to get the Republican nominee into office, we could be ready to roll, baby. I would love that. It's just a little window into what that second administration would look like. And when you want a nice window into your house, you got to check out Renewal by Anderson. Text Knowles to 200-300. For most homeowners, window replacement is not something they've ever done before, and it can be intimidating. Luckily, there's a company that will do the work for you. Renewal by Anderson is your one-stop shop for window design, manufacture, and installation. Windows play a crucial role in regulating indoor temperatures. If you notice a spike in your heating or cooling bills, it might be due to inefficient windows. Don't put it off any longer. Renewal by Anderson offers limited, fully transferable, and best-in-the-nation warranty coverage. I had, I've mentioned this before, I had a carpenter write in, totally unsolicited. He said, hey, Michael, I was listening to your show, heard you mention Renewal by Anderson, and I just got to tell you, they're great. I, any house I work on that has Renewal by Anderson windows, it's just better quality than anyone else. So right now, go check out Renewal by Anderson. They are offering a free in-home consultation in quality, energy-efficient, affordable windows or patio doors with special financing options. Text Knowles, Canada WLES, to 200300 300 for a free consultation to buy one window or door and get one 40% off. Plus, you'll get 200 bucks off your entire purchase. The savings won't last long. Check it out by texting Knowles, Canada WLES, to 20300. Text Knowles to 20300. Texting privacy policy and terms and conditions. Special to textplan.us. Texting enrolls for recurring automated text marketing messages. Message and data rates may apply. Reply stop, stop, stop. Minimum purchase required. Interest accrues from date of purchase, but is way you've paid within the promotional period. Go to windowappointmentnow.com for full offer details. Ugh. It is a time of land to penitential time. And so, when you want your home to smell like a nice 12th century monastery, you might want to check out the smells and bells candle available in the Daily Wire shop right now. The perfect accessory for the Michael Knowles show for the Memchum Segmentum La Creme de la Creme. It's right here. The Smells and Bells candle. Elevate your surroundings. Capture the spirit of timeless spaces. Get your Smells and Bells candle at dailywire.com slash shop. Get yours before they sell. We have sold a shocking amount of these candles, so they probably will sell out, but get yours now if you want your home to smell. To smell like spaces of Smells and Bells. Uh, my favorite comment yesterday is from Forza Jersey, who says, what's amazing is that Mid-Journey has no problem showing white people in stereotypically white roles. Yeah, yeah, it's weird, isn't it? The, the other AI services, when you ask them to depict things, they depict things as they usually look. But the Google AI service uh, erases white people from all of life and history. It's kind of weird. It's almost like the problem is not so much with the AI as with the Google. <laughs> it's almost like Google, I'm beginning to get the impression, Google might not like white people very much. I'm not, not positive, but that's what I'm starting to think. Okay, speaking of Trump, Trump's in big trouble for making this historic claim. You're really up against a war machine in Russia. Russia, what they do, they defeated Hitler, they defeated Napoleon. You know, they're a war machine. Cue all the social media posts. Trump thinks Russia defeated Hitler? Uh, they, yes, they did. They did. Correct. So it's funny to, I'm, I'm watching a pretty good documentary on Netflix right now. It's, I didn't think that sentence would leave my mouth ever again, but there's a pretty good one on World War II uh, from the front lines. And it, it's good. It's like they gave the Peter Jackson treatment from World War I to World War II and they colorize things. and It's really pretty interesting. And you, you kind of forget, even if you do read history books in America, you kind of forget that Russia defeated Hitler and that we had a little bit to do with it, but not that much. We, we defeated Japan and Britain held firm and you know they wouldn't give up and they will never surrender. But Russia really defeated Hitler. 
And you kind of forget that now. And especially because we're living at a, a time of intense anti-Russian propaganda because we're fighting a proxy war for some reason with Russia over Ukraine. Why? I don't, because we want to bring Ukraine into the EU and into NATO for some reason. Again, because our genius statesmen in the Joe Biden State Department clearly uh, are, are probably less historically literate even than these Twitter users freaking out over Trump, pointing out an obvious historical fact. But we don't know anything about history anymore. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know much about anything at all. I guess, look, we don't know the definition of marriage. I guess we don't know the definition of very much of anything. But speaking of history class, big report out from Wall Street Journal that half of college grads are working jobs that don't use their degrees. And I think this actually relates directly to people's historical illiteracy, their literary illiteracy, their philosophical total ignorance these days, just even compared with 20, 30 years ago. Uh, half of college grads are working jobs that don't use their degrees. Good. Good. <laughs> You're not, the point of a college degree is not to train you for a job. That is what trade school is for. Some, some elitists look down on trade school. I don't know why they look down on trade school. Trade school is great. Trade school trains you for a job, and you, everyone has to work a job at some point. Unless you're of independent means and you're really going to go live some aristocratic life, everyone's got to work a job, so everyone needs some kind of job training. And so you go to trade school. And trade schools can look all sorts of different ways. You can go to trade school to learn how to work on floors. You can go to trade school to learn how to work uh, as an electrician. You can go to trade school to learn as a work as a doctor or a lawyer. Those are other types of trade schools, but that's, that's just where you learn your profession. And these days, if you learn how to be an electrician or a plumber or to uh, or a carpenter or something like that, you'll probably make more money than the lawyers will because we have way too many lawyers because of the degradation of undergraduate education. The point of undergraduate education, liberal arts education, is not to learn how to do a job. It's to learn how to think. It's to learn how to read dusty old books and learn about your culture and cultivate your rational will and learn philosophy and learn history and and cult and learn math, abstract mathematics, and just, and to cultivate those things. The, the, the actual point of undergraduate education, liberal arts education, is to prepare yourself for leisure time. It's to prepare yourself not to work. And this frankly ties into Americans' addiction to working. It's good that we have a strong work ethic in America. It's good that we're productive and we provide for our families and Having traveled a little bit in Europe, Americans work way, way harder than Europeans do most of the time. I think of my own ancestral people, the Italians. Many wonderful things you can say about the Italians. They're not the most motivated people when it comes, you know, they like a little pizzolino in the afternoon and they a little, they're a little bit slower about it. Uh, so I do like that. That's a good thing about Americans. But, but Americans f focus so obsessively on their work, they don't know what to do when they're not working. And the reason they don't know what to do when they're not working is because we have no focus in America on cultivating the inner life and cultivating your desires for hobbies, your desires for culture. So we lose that. And, and it's a political problem because when you don't have a culture that you love, when you don't have these customs and traditions and hobbies and habits, then it's, it's very easy for political elites to go in and, and erase your culture. It's very easy for them to impose a new culture upon you. Half of college grads aren't working jobs that use their degree, that are working jobs that do not use their degrees. That's a good start, is what I call that. Should be. <laughs> I mean, I guess my, I guess my job sort of uses my degree, and that I talk about history and Italian literature, but it's only tangentially. Okay, only, only a little bit. Speaking of people working odd jobs, Paul Ryan, former Speaker of the House of Representatives is accusing Donald Trump of being the establishment of the Republican Party. And he makes half a good point. He says, I'm in the minority in my party right now. I'm not in the establishment. I'm frankly an anti-establishment Republican. It's very funny to think of Paul Ryan. <laughs> it's like he was constructed in a lab at the Coke factories or something, you know, K-O-C-K, -K, not, not C-O-K-E. He, he is, you know, establishment in the sense that he'd been in Washington basically his whole life. But he says, no, I'm now anti-establishment. I think you can safely argue, I don't enjoy acknowledging this, that Trump is the establishment and Trump populism is the establishment and that Trump populism is this more isolationist strain that I think is wrong and dangerous and I don't support. But that does represent a large swath of Republican voters. I, I, I don't 
totally hate Paul Ryan. I know a lot of conservatives do. I don't. I, I like it. Seems like a straight enough shooter, and he is a little bit out of touch with where the political moment is. But I, I think he's trying to be a straight shooter here. I just think he's totally wrong. You cannot argue to me that Trump is part of the political establishment when the actual political establishment is upending centuries of American political tradition to try to throw him in prison and hope that he dies there, okay? They're prosecuting him on four fronts so that this man will die in prison. Never prosecuted a former president like this. Never prosecuted a leader of the opposition like this. You can't tell me that guy's the establishment. What, what's confusing to Paul Ryan here is that Trump is the leader of the Republican Party. And some people tried to challenge him for the, the nomination this cycle. It was never going to go anywhere. People thought he was a, a joke in 2016. They, everyone was shocked when, when he just ran through the Republican Party and recrafted it after his own uh, political vision. But the reason for that is the the liberals have taken over I think at this point it's safe to say every institution in society. There, there used to be a couple of holdouts, you know, the, the military, say, but the top, I mean, obviously, soldiers, sailors, Marines, you know, uh, all, all, our, our military service members tend to be pretty conservative. But the top brass of the Pentagon, they're big libs now. It's Mark Milley screaming about critical race theory and white rage. So even even that part, I think, has been remade by the liberals. There is one sector of society, though, that remains conservative, and it's the people. The people are pretty conservative. I'm not saying they're all rock-ribbed right-wingers. I'm just saying they're pretty conservative. Whatever the political elites are saying, wherever they are on the political spectrum, the people are, are more conservative than they are. The people don't really think a man can become a woman. The people don't really want open borders. The people don't really think that we ought to be risking America's sovereignty and treasure and certainly blood for Ukraine and NATO expansion or whatever. The people are more conservative, and Trump appeals to the people. That's the populism that Paul Ryan is talking about. But don't tell me that that therefore makes Trump the establishment. Quite the opposite. What, what that represents here. I mean, don't, Paul Ryan is on the board of News Corp, isn't he? This, guy, this, guy's, this guy's a major part of the political establishment. It's just he's fallen out of favor with the voters. And the fact that there is a huge chasm now between the people and pretty much every other institution in society tells you something about where we are. You know, getting back to Bukele's point, we're designed to see things linearly, not exponentially. Regimes change over time. And uh, a lot of comparisons have been made about America to the fall of Rome. But the question is, is it the fall of the Roman Republic or the Roman Empire? And uh, Drew Clavin answered this. Uh, Drew and I have been talking about this for years at this point. People make this mistake and they think it's the fall of the empire. If you're going to draw the historical comparison, and I think comparisons to the fall of Rome are overused, but the, the comparison would be to the fall of the Republic. And then things start to change. And you don't even catch them changing as they are. But a, a major change would be that at the fall of the Republic, the established institutions of Rome in no way represented the people. The, the man who represented the people was Julius Caesar. So the, that's how he was able to take power. So the the, the fear here among the people who, who are all worried about populism is misplaced. They need, to, they need to ask themselves, why is it that the people broadly are turning against every established institution in society? If we're living in a republic of government of the people, by the people, for the people, why have all the institutions turned against the people's interests? Also join Daily Wire Plus during our President's Day sale. Save 30% on your annual Daily Wire Plus membership with code DW30 at checkout. DW30. Okay, Daily Wire Plus membership is your exclusive backstage pass to engaging conversations with the smartest and most trusted and sexiest talent in America. It's your front row seat to the Daily Wire's upcoming hit movies and series like The Pendragon Cycle, Mr. Bertram, Snow White and the Evil Queen, and more. Experience it all and so much more, 30% off during the President's Day sale, dailywire.com slash subscribe. DW30 is the code at checkout. Our mailbag is sponsored by Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, Canada BLAS to claim eligibility for your free brand new Samsung 5G smartphone. Take it away. Hey, Michael. I'm up here in America's Evil Top Hat still. I haven't moved down south yet. Uh, my dad died today. 78 years old, tongue cancer, 
He was euthanized through the MADE program. There's a process to graft skin from his arm to make a new tongue, but the wait list was like six months long. And my dad started to refuse morphine appointments and called MADE. My whole family okayed it, except for me. It was four days between the appointment and the assisted suicide. Uh, it, it's, I, it's 45 times quicker to kill yourself than to heal yourself here. Okay. That, that's my rant. Um, my question is really about prayer. In his late years, he apostatized the same time that I kind of started to find faith. And I prayed for him each of these four days that I knew he was going to die. But uh, how, do, how do you pray for the dead? Hmm. I've taken mortality for granted my entire life, and I've hit a brick wall. We had unresolved issues, and I have so many questions for him. How would you go about this? Thanks, well, Michael. God bless. Uh, really, really sorry to hear of that sad end. Uh, one hopes that your father's uh, culpability would be, and, and the culpability of your family would be somewhat reduced by the fact that the culture is deluding so many people. It's, it's creating such an inducement to kill yourself. As you say, 45 times faster to kill yourself than to heal yourself. Uh, and suicide, of course, contrary to natural law, uh, just a, a, a grave, grave evil that any government would, would encourage. Uh, so, so, so awful. Uh, terribly sorry to hear it. And I can pray for you and your father, and you can pray for your father too. Uh, prayer for the dead is, is biblical. You see it uh, throughout the Bible, uh, specifically in Maccabees. It's funny, as some, later on, certain books of the Bible were removed <laughs> because they contradicted certain doctrines, but books of the Bible had been in there from the beginning, and uh, so it seems to me the doctrines are pretty sound, one of which is to pray for the dead. Now, I have no idea where your father is. You have no idea where your father is. I don't want to give you some soft soap or wishful thinking, but I can tell you, as James tells us, that the prayers of the righteous are efficacious. And so uh, this is another inducement. I was thinking about this yesterday or the day before. This is another inducement to be good, <laughs> to try to avoid sinning and to keep yourself close to Christ and to avail yourself of the sacraments, is is not only because uh, that's what you owe God and not only because it's good for you, uh, but also it will make your prayers more efficacious. <laughs> it, will, it will draw you closer to God. So uh, you you certainly ought to do that. There's a story about St. Padre Pio. I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, that one time uh, he was praying and uh, he was asked who he was praying for. He said, I'm praying for my great-grandfather or something like that. I'm sure I'm getting the story wrong. I said, you can't pray for your great-grandfather. Your great-great-grandfather, you know, died however many years before you were born. And he said, that's how we experience time. That's not how God experiences time. <laughs> you know, and, and that part, of course, we know is true for a fact because God is outside of time and space, except when he enters into time and space. Uh, so, though even then, I guess he's also outside of time and space. So, in any case, uh, I, would, I would just pray for your father. You know, I say, when, when I hear someone dies, I say the RIP prayer. Anyone who objects to praying for the dead, ironically, probably has prayed for the dead quite a lot and does pray for the dead because R.I.P., if you've ever written or said R.I.P., that's a prayer for the dead. It's requiescat in pace, may he rest in peace. And the prayer is requiem eternam, uh, requiem eternam dona ei domine et lux perpetua uh, luceat ei requiescat in pace, in nomine patris filet spiritus sancti, amen, you know, uh, Eternal rest grant unto him, O Lord, and perpetual light shine upon him. Uh, may he rest in peace. So that's a good prayer to start with, and then you can just say other prayers. You know, you can you can you can just kind of talk to God. <laughs> you know, it doesn't need to. I, I like form form and liturgy. I think that's good, and it aids in our in our prayer life. But you can also just talk to him, especially when you're this raw. So very sorry for your loss. Next one, Dirty Mike, Mister Reality here. On Tuesday, you were talking about your conspiracy expansion pack for your yes or no game, and it made me think of a conspiracy that I wanted your take on. DEI always seems to put the least qualified people in charge, right? It doesn't seem like you just pick a random black person out of a hat. It doesn't seem like you pick the best black person you could find. It seems like you pick the worst. That's how DEI works. Claudine Gay, worst. Katanji Brown-Jackson, worst. Every DEI pick seems terrible. So my question is, since the people picking these people are, as we know, 
extremely racist Democrats who would probably put black people in chains in a second. Do you think they pick the worst black people they can find on purpose to create a narrative that black people aren't good at things that will then lead into them being relegated to the dregs of society again? Is this a big conspiracy? Thanks. Mm, I, I'm not totally persuaded by that, in part because Claudine Gay was, was pretty bad. Obviously, she plagiarized at least half of her academic corpus, and her academic corpus was extremely small. It was 11 papers. 11 publications is what you should have in graduate school, not when you're the president of Harvard. Katanji Jackson is probably a little bit more impressive. I believe she went to law school with Ted Cruz. And uh, Katanji, I mean, she, she doesn't seem like the brightest bulb in the pack, but she doesn't seem dumb either. She's probably pretty intelligent and just is totally wrong. I mean, she's pretty radical. Um, so I, I don't think they picked the very worst. I mean, if you really wanted to pick the very worst sort of stereotype you'd think of, if you, if you remember the old Martin Lawrence show, Martin Lawrence had this, this character that he would do, which was the, the most extreme caricature of a really ghetto black woman, and the character's name was Shanene. You know, Shanene would be the version of that. <laughs> and and they don't, that's not Claudine Gay and that's not Katanji Jackson or anybody. So no, I don't think that's it. Um, and, and there, there are uh, black people who have been promoted to the very heights of civic life who are extremely impressive, including on the Supreme Court, most notably Clarence Thomas. But I think there you see the problem, right? Which is Clarence Thomas is extremely impressive and obviously very intelligent and educated and has good judgment and is conservative. So, you know, you're, they're, they're just trying to ask for so many things but the the most important lens is the ideological lens. So they have to pick some leftist. And the the people they're picking are getting less and less impressive, I think, because they're making more ideological demands that, that uh, preclude reason and right judgment. Next question. Hi, Michael. It's the Shuckmeister. In quantum physics, there's this concept known as the Pauli exclusion principle, which basically states that two electrons cannot have the same quantum numbers at the same time. So to speak, if a 22-year-old electron has the quantum numbers of enjoying brunch and dancing on stage, a 65-year-old electron could not. However, you've spoken about something I dub the Dolly exclusion principle, meaning that the laws of physics and the natural order apply to everyone except for Dolly Parton. How how did you come to this breakthrough in physics, and when can we expect you'll receive the Nobel Prize? Hmm. Thanks. I'll be waiting for the Nobel, but uh, the breakthrough is just so clear. When did I come to it? When I observed Dolly. I like the name, the Dolly Exclusion Principle, and it's true. 65-year-olds, or I don't know how old Dolly is now, they don't, they don't get to dance around in short shorts and crop tops unless they're Dolly Parton. And uh, is, I don't know, I mean, again, I didn't, I didn't make the rules. But that is the case. So what you're really asking me is, how can there be ex exceptions and exclusions to rules? That's a good question. I mean, we know in physics, there are all sorts of exceptions that have uh, upended models for a very long time. I mean, it seems to me every, every few months now we're reading about some new revelation about the nature of dark matter or dark energy because we have these, we fill in the gaps on, on things that we don't know that don't quite match our models to say nothing of like the general theory of relativity or anything like that where the models don't totally match up with reality. And then they're, so, okay, in part that could just be our own ignorance and we'll discover a way to perfect that. All models are wrong, but some are useful. But, but furthermore, there are exceptions even to the the laws of nature themselves, and those are called miracles. That's what a miracle is. A miracle is uh, something that in the natural course of events would not occur. So it's supernatural. And, and that happens. That's, that's part of the created world. A lot of the materialists don't want to acknowledge this, but then they're left scratching their heads when miraculous things do happen. So to, to what do I attribute Dolly's uh, unique character? Is it our ignorance or is it just a miracle? How should I know? Next question. 
Good morning, Michael. This is Arun. As you know from a previous voicemail of mine, I am deeply fearful of these criminal indictments against Donald Trump. The basis of that fear is my observation that most Americans, i.e. those outside of the creme de la creme and certainly most liberal voters, possess a dangerous combination of political apathy, ignorance, a lack of attention span, and an enthusiasm to vote with reckless alacrity. Now, admittedly, I live in a sort of right-wing bubble, since all of my friends and family are politically conservative. And I know you have previously assured me that most Americans would be horrified by the spectacle of a former president and current presidential candidate behind bars on the eve of an election. But I do live in a large liberal city, and when I go out to bars and other public places, I often make it a point to talk to random people about politics. And while these people tend to have fairly reasonable opinions, they nonetheless have a baseless trust in the federal justice system and almost always say that they would not vote for Trump if he is convicted of a crime. And this is not just my anecdotal observation. At least one recent poll showed that 55% of Americans would not vote for Trump if he were convicted. Now, I think that Donald Trump was the greatest American president since Lincoln, since Washington, and even since King Ashoka of ancient India. But I donated to Vivek because, as he put it, to nominate Trump is to send him into a buzzsaw. Alas, it appears that Trump will be our nominee, and of course he has my full support, but I still lack confidence in our fellow Americans. Mm. My question for you is twofold. From whence do you drive your trust in the wisdom of the American public? And should Trump be convicted in the months leading up to the election, how do we convince the American electorate to vote for him? Thank you, as always, for your wisdom. Great question, as always, Arun. Well, you mentioned large liberal city. That's where you're talking to these people. So I, I have no doubt that that's what they believe, and they, they do have a uh, mindless trust, not only in the justice system, but in most aspects of government in these large liberal cities. So that, that doesn't surprise me. I guess the, play, the reason I still have a great deal of confidence in the American people is, one, because they're American, and Americans have always been a little bit more conservative and, and than, say, the French or something like that. But, but two, because I have trust in people more broadly to maintain some of the common sense. This is uh, what Antonio Gramsci, the Italian communist theorist, bemoaned about the communist revolutions, as he said, th these radicals, they, they lost the common sense. And if you don't hold on to the common sense, you're not going to have an effective revolution because the people aren't going to like your theories. They're going to like their stuff and their habits and their way of life more than they like your theories. So I think we still, the American people still possess a great deal of common sense. And then how do you convince those people to vote for him? Well, you're, you're not convincing the people in the big liberal cities generally. It's just a waste of time, probably. Uh, you're convincing people in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Arizona and uh, th those sorts of places, Georgia, to, to vote for Trump. And how do you do it? Well, you tailor it to each state. To use just the example of Michigan, you know. Uh, you make an appeal to the large Muslim population in Michigan that the Democrats have encouraged to come in, and you say, hey, do you want, do you want to vote for Joe Biden, who is like completely insane and wants to chop off kids' genitals and you know, uh, upend everything that's normal? Or you want to vote for Trump, who is just kind of normal? You, want to vote, you probably want to vote for the normal guy, right? I, I think in a lot of these swing states, you just you need to convince people that Trump is the more normal person. And it's weird because he's a billionaire playboy from New York who's a TV star and a uh, real estate mogul. And I know he doesn't seem normal. For most of Joe's career, Joe's shtick was that he was normal. But he's not normal. He's opened our country to an invasion of over 6 million people. Joe Biden is saying that either, you know, they're going to threaten taking your kids away from you if you don't them. They're going to bring the weight of the federal government to bear on not only but even Joe Biden is the one who's going to get us into World War III. He's not normal. And so we've talked recently because of my favorite Twitter account, Edmund Smirk's theory of normality, uh, about how it's really important to hold on to normality. It's the same insight that, that Gramsci is pointing out. You need, to have, you need to seem like you're the normal common sense person. And can Trump do that? Yes. Will he do that? That remains to be seen. If you want to join us for the Membrum Segmentum, it will be Fake Headline Friday. So head on over there. Use code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. Check out two months free on all annual plans.